traditionally the People's Organization for Progress from the time that we were founded uh, in 1982, we have always commemorated the birthday of Malcolm X and also the assassination date of Malcolm X. Uh, particularly since it falls in February, it was February 21st, 1965, when Malcolm X was assassinated. The title of our program tonight is honoring the legacy of Malcolm X. And we have a very distinguished panel of experts on this topic, um, all of whom have written about Malcolm and all of whom has have been involved with efforts uh, to keep that legacy alive. Uh, tonight, our panelists uh, include my friend of many years, uh, Dr. William Sales, who I first met uh, in the uh, mid 1970s when we were campaigning against apartheid uh, on the campus of Princeton University. And uh, he was the author of a pamphlet that we used extensively uh, during that struggle. Uh, it was called uh, Southern Africa, Black America, same struggle, same fight. Uh, our other uh, panelist is Dr. Kelly Harris, who is also uh, the chair of the, uh, he's the director of the Department of African American Studies at Seton Hall University. He is an activist and has written about Malcolm and has been uh, very active in POP and POP activities. Uh, the next panelist will be uh, Brother Zaid Muhammad, who from the time that I met him was a student of Malcolm X, who has read extensively uh, not only the uh, speeches of Malcolm, but also uh, the writings of others on Malcolm. And more importantly, he's been involved in organizations like the Malcolm X uh, Commemoration Coalition in New York that has been keeping alive the ideas that Malcolm stood for. And then we have Dr. Todd Burroughs. Speaking of the star ledger, I told Andy Richards, uh, who, who I think is still on this call, who is uh, writing for the star ledger now, that she needed to meet uh, Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs, uh, who I met before he came to the star ledger. I met when he was writing uh, for the Afro-American newspaper. Uh, in Newark, which was edited by the current president of the Newark branch of the NAACP, um, Deborah Smith Gregory. Woo! So we're going to hear from we're going to hear from each of the panelists. Um, I'm asking each of the panelists. Uh, we're giving you each about 20 minutes for your presentation, uh, and we'll have each of you will get 20 minutes a chance to speak, and after. All the panelists have spoken. Then we will have a question and answer period. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Sales. Let me just read the uh, bio of Dr. Uh, William Sales, William W. Sales Jr., a retired associate professor and past chairperson of the Department of African American Studies and director of the Center for African American Studies at Seton Hall University. He received the PhD in political science from Columbia University and also holds a master's of international affairs degree from Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. Dr. Sales undergraduate education was at the University of Pennsylvania where he graduated with honors in international relations. A recognized expert on Malcolm X, Dr. Sales is the author of two books, from Civil Rights to Black Liberation, Malcolm X and the Organization of Afro-American Unity, and Southern Africa, Black America, Same Struggle, Same Fight. He also authored numerous articles in the field of African-American studies. Dr. Sales is a veteran of the civil rights and student power movements. His activism as head of the campus chapter of the NAACP at Penn in 1963-64 led to the 
formulation and adoption of the Philadelphia plan for the integration of the building trades. He was also a part of the leadership in the massive campus protest and takeover at Columbia University in the spring of 1968. During the 1970s and 80s, Dr. Sales established an exemplary record as a community organizer and activist in Harlem, New York City, for which he was honored in 1987 with Columbia's University's Revson Fellowship. A Pan-African internationalist and member of the African Liberation Support Committee in the early 1970s, Dr. Sales was a delegate to the sixth Pan-African Congress in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and has traveled to Cuba on six occasions. And in 1990, at the invitation of Cuban scholars, participated in an international conference on Malcolm X. In November of that same year, Dr. Sales co-directed the first comprehensive international conference on Malcolm X held in New York City at the borough of Manhattan Community College. Dr. Sales is presently a oh. member of the board of directors of the Interreligious Foundation on Community Organization. With no further ado, our friend and comrade, Dr. William Sales. All right, thank you, man. <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to cut that bio a little shorter. <laughs> but thanks. It's, it, it, it's great to hear it read by such an auspicious person as yourself. Um, and uh, I'm gonna get right with it because Malcolm is important because his experiences are typical of the experiences that transformed African-Americans in the 20th century. That is the move from rural peasantry to industrial proletariat to post-industrial redundancy. That transformation prepared black people for a truly revolutionary role. Malcolm is one of the two most important black leadership figures in the second half of the 20th century. Along with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X clarified the alternatives facing black people in the post-industrial period. Malcolm's intervention into the movement was primarily ideological. <clears throat> Tens of thousands of black people were energized by Malcolm to take action. <clears throat> he articulated their moods, feelings, and sensibilities in ways that helped them gain greater clarity as to who they were what their problems were, and how they might go about building a movement to liberate themselves. Malcolm did this not through innovative thinking and ideas, but through a down-to-earth re-articulation of the Black radical tradition. <clears throat> that Black radical tradition had roots in 19th century pan-Negro nationalism, 20th century pan-Africanism and Garveyism, and the class struggle approach of the African blood brotherhood. Malcolm X came to understand more perfectly this black radical tradition in the last 11 months of his life. The time of his death, he was advancing a synthesis of the revolutionary pan-African international tradition with the more conservative elements of black economic and cultural religious nationalism that he had inherited from the nation of Islam. This synthesis was further impacted by the need of Malcolm X to be responsive to constituencies with strong proletarian traditions in cities like Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia, and his base in Harlem. Malcolm recognized that black liberation had to begin with the psychological emancipation of black people from the internalized self-concept of racial inferiority. This unbrainwashing of entire people required a psychological rapprochement with Africa and an embrace of the entire history of people of African descent before and after the Holocaust and slave trade and slavery. Malcolm X argued for a reconstruction of Black cultural identity, which explicitly recognized not only African roots and identity, but the class character, the two contradictory cultural tendencies among Black people as well. 
Malcolm argued that the culture and mentality of the house Negro was false consciousness. It was based on assimilating the worldview and culture of the white supremacist as a condition of survival. Rather, Malcolm opted for a cultural frame of reference based on the worldview and experience of field Negroes, whose emancipation was based only on the destruction of the master and all his works. Malcolm X was central to the restoration of the resistance tradition in African-American religious life. James Cone, our leading scholar of Black liberation theology, argued that it was Malcolm X's harsh criticism of the accommodationist orientations of church-based civil rights leadership that was a major impetus which forced the Black church to question what had become of the prophetic role of the Black church. Malcolm X committed to believe in a religion that would help him fight back against oppression. He believed Islam was that religion. Subsequent generations of African Americans, therefore, have taken a serious look at Islam as an alternative to Christianity. And that's why it's the fastest growing religion among African Americans today. Malcolm, in the latter part of his life, moved away from determinations based solely on skin color. He began to categorize friends and enemies on the basis of their behavior alone. He asserted that the enemy confronting the world's people of color was the white supremacist and colonialist governments organized politically and militarily as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Thus, for Malcolm, the struggle against this enemy was an international, anti-imperialist, anti-racist struggle for national liberation and human rights. The natural allies of African Americans were all of the nations and peoples of color who had experienced racist Western imperialism. Malcolm X was hopeful that this group could be an effective counterweight to the tremendous power of NATO for two reasons. First, he saw it as constituting a majority of the world's people. And secondly, this coalition was achieving national liberation and state power. Consequently, it represented a growing power block within international institutions like the United Nations and the World Court. African-Americans could get recognition and support from this majority of color if, Malcolm felt, they reconstituted their movement not around the principle of civil rights, but as a legitimate national liberation struggle. One of the most important realizations of Malcolm and his two trips to Africa in 1964 was that the struggle of Black people in the United States lacked an international identity that would encourage and facilitate international organizations, nations, and movements coming to its defense. He saw the organization of Afro-American unity, which he created on the 20th of June in 1964, as a vehicle around which the national identity of Black people could be consolidated. The ability of African nations to give African Americans a platform for indicting the US government in international forums like the UN and the World Court was a key ingredient in the platform of Malcolm X's OAAU. He saw the OAAU as a hemispheric affiliate of the Organization of African Unity, which had also in 1964 come into existence. Malcolm was given diplomatic status at the heads of state meeting of the OAU in Cairo on the 20th of July in 1964. And it was there that he submitted a memorandum to that body outlining the treatment of US black people by the United States government. To present the demands of African-American people in their national capacity required the construction of a black united front Malcolm felt that the OAAU had to be that front. But he articulated the principles upon which such a Black United Front had to be constructed. For him, it had to be democratic, which he understand to mean that it had to give a voice to the most oppressed and exploited segments of the Black community. And it had to be accountable to those segments first and foremost. The Black United Front therefore had to make space for the poor and the lumpen elements to articulate their agenda and assume leadership positions in the struggle. 
Malcolm did not desire a charismatic form of leadership in his organization. He preferred a style which was more in the tradition of cadre development promoted by Ella Baker among young SNCC workers in the Deep South. That model encouraged those who had never seen themselves as leaders and decision makers to, to recognize that potential within their collective I self. Make sprouts too. Malcolm X was such an organic intellectual, a leader who was from the masses and molded by the masses as they experienced struggle. Malcolm told his close associate, Earl Grant, which I'll quote briefly, he said to Earl, I do not want an organization that depended on the life of one man. The organization must be able to survive on its own, end quote. Malcolm X's conception of leadership confronted the question of the role of women head on. He made special efforts to put women in leadership roles in the OAAU. In this, his practice departed from his tenure in the nation of Islam. Women like Lynn Shiflet, Gloria Richardson, and Fannie Lou Hamer had demonstrated to Mac Malcolm X the capacity of women to lead. His experiences in Africa in 1964 demonstrated that it was essential for women to assume leadership positions if national liberation were to be achieved. OAAU cadres were instructed by Malcolm X that Africa will not be free until it frees its women. Malcolm also felt that the Black United Front had to assume responsibility for the defense and welfare of the entire Black community in the U.S. In the OAAU Statement of Principles, it is clearly accepted that responsibility. In electoral politics, the Black United Front would function independently of the Democratic and Republican parties. Malcolm X saw these two parties as mere factions of a single white supremacist party. The Black United Front would test the limits of the effectiveness of the electoral arena for Black liberation. Or as Malcolm X put it, it would be the ballot or the bullet. Its politics would not be limited to the electoral arena nor constrained by nonviolence, but would draw upon the experience of national liberation struggles throughout the world to resist by any means necessary. Malcolm X's politics of black liberation was prepared to legitimize tactics from the vote and nonviolent direct action to urban guerrilla warfare. Malcolm spoke frankly about the role of violence in four areas of social conflict. First, he affirmed the right of self-defense as a fundamental human right. In this, he is actually joined by King and Gandhi, despite much information on that point. Second, Malcolm recognized a psychological need to be able to respond to the violence of the oppressor as a fundamental condition of manhood and self-respect. One could not claim to be fully human while accepting passively the brutalization of one's women and children. In this, Malcolm opens up the discussion more fully explored by Franz Fanon in the opening chapter on violence in his Magnus Opum, The Wretched of the Earth. Third, Malcolm saw national struggles as necessarily violent. According to Malcolm, the essence of the oppression of nations worldwide was the usurpation of their sovereign control of their own national territory. Since the process of usurping this territory was violent, its restoration would necessarily also be violent. Moreover, the actual observable process of national liberation was everywhere a violent one. And therefore, if black people saw themselves as a nation desiring liberation, then they must be prepared to do what history mandates in terms of national liberation. They must be prepared to wage a violent fight for it. Last, if individuals have a fundamental human right to self-defense, Malcolm said, he asked a question, do peoples have a collective right of self-defense? This question he answered in the affirmative and went on to move on to ponder how that right might be most efficiently exercised. Here, Malcolm felt a serious look at urban guerrilla warfare is in order. Everywhere strong imperialist armies are being confronted in the world, some form of guerrilla warfare is being used by the forces of national liberation, he argued. 
If black people in the United States have the collective right to self-defense, then he had questioned, is some form of urban guerrilla warfare in order? In the decades after Malcolm's demise, the question of revolutionary violence and self-defense was taken up by the Revolutionary Action Movement, RAM, the Black Panther Party, the Republic of New Africa, and a host of kindred groups. For some, Malcolm X's catchphrase phrase, by any means necessary, meant resort to urban guerrilla warfare. To others, especially those in a radical left tradition like James Boggs, it signified working class revolution led by street youth against organized into a vanguard party. For the Republic of New Africa, it required relocation and concentration of black people on a Southern national homeland, which could be liberated by revolution. Therefore, it's no surprise that the FBI's COINTELPRO program was a preemptive strike at the legacy of Malcolm X to prevent the transformation of the civil rights movement into a viable movement of national liberation. By the end of the 1970s, SNCC, RAM, the Black Panthers, and the RNA were either repressed into non-existence or rendered impotent with large numbers of their cadre incarcerated as political prisoners or at least disillusioned and no longer active. However, Malcolm X's legacy survived the nadir of the early 1980s as he was rediscovered by a new generation of youth. The legacy of Malcolm X has flourished in four major areas of black life. In academia, in archival libraries and museum institutions, in popular culture, and most importantly, in political thought and action. In the decade after Malcolm's death, Black activist scholars formed two professional organizations of Black studies that reflected Malcolm's influence, the African Heritage Studies Association and the National Council of Black Studies. In 1987, the Malcolm X Work Group came into existence with the purpose of networking with those involved in major research and publication efforts. The Malcolm X Work Group was able to facilitate the organization of two international conferences on Malcolm X. Another initiative launched in 1990 was the Malcolm X Commemoration Commission. The brainchild of activists Ryan Daniels and Dr. Jane Turner of Cornell's Africana Studies and Research Center. These are but a few of some of the major efforts in the field to keep Malcolm's legacy alive. The most extensive website resource on Malcolm X, brothermalcolm.net, was another initiative of Dr. Abdul Khanak. It was followed in 2001 by the Columbia University-based research website associated with the Malcolm X Papers process under the direction of Mount Manny Marable. F. Leon Wilson of St. John's University established a Malcolm X discussion forum online. While not yet digitized, the late social work scholar Preston Wilcox created a Malcolm X Lovers Network and has the most extensive clipping files that I know of. They are now housed at the Schoenberg Center. There are additional archival resources on Malcolm at Emory University, at the Schomburg Center, and Columbia has now uh, uh, completed their Malcolm X Papers project. Major commemorative museums and centers dedicated to Malcolm X's legacy have emerged in the last 20 years. Several documentary films have been produced, <coughs> excuse me, on his legacy. <coughs> And by the early 1990s, Malcolm had become an icon of hip hop culture. At the beginning of the 1970s, the quest for the Black United Front was reflected politically in the formation of the Congress of African Peoples. In 1972, by the National Black Political Convention in Gary, Indiana. The last was an attempt to give organizational substance to the idea of independent Black electoral politics. In 1972, African Americans created the African Liberation Support Committee. It sent tens of thousands of dollars of aid to the liberation movements in Africa over the next several years and held demonstrations that evolved over 100,000 people in over 20 North American cities. It was also an organization within which the debate about the interaction of race and class and a serious study of Marxism was introduced. The 1990s renewed interest in Malcolm's political views. 
This reflected successes achieved by the liberation struggles in Southern Africa, as well as the apparent new militancy of Black youth in response to the brouhaha around the brutalization of Rodney King, and by the end of the last generation of the 20th century, some old veterans of the civil rights and black power movements attempted to reignite the flame. They had a conference of over 800 radicals in Chicago, out of which came the Black Radical Congress. Another poll in this struggle of popular forces are the African-American NGOs like the December 12th movement with the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparation in Africa and COBRA and the National Reparations Congress. They've acted on Malcolm X's admonition to take the African-American human rights struggle and demand for reparations to the United Nations. After many years of patient lobbying in Geneva, links were forged with other NGOs in Africa and its diaspora, which by the beginning of the millennium had achieved notable breakthroughs. Four major achievements reflect Malcolm X's legacy in this area. First, the achievement of NGO status within the United Nations. Second, the establishment of an international network of NGOs engaged in anti-racist pro-reparations advocacy. Third, the convening under UN auspices of an international conference on racism, xenophobia, and other forms of oppression in Durban, South Africa in August of 2001. At that conference, the slave trade, slavery, and colonialism were recognized as crimes against humanity. Lastly, this motion has succeeded in appointing a special United Nations Rapporteur on Racism, who reports periodically to the United Nations on his or her investigation of the treatment of racial and ethnic communities and minorities throughout the world. Lastly, I should mention that Malcolm challenged the rise to leadership of the black bourgeoisie. The black bourgeois political and economic stratum reinforces the model of assimilation based on achievement, which has been at the center of the neoconservative resurgence in the late 20th century. Malcolm's critique of the House Negro is a critique of black bourgeois leadership. This developing critique and exposure of this stat strata, which was initiated by Malcolm X, continues in the pages of Black Agenda Report and itself is also the legacy of the late Glenn Ford. The US government reaction to the attacks on the World Trade Center in New York City and the Pentagon on September 11th 2001 has led to the drastic curtailment of civil liberties and the fatal compromising of the Bill of Rights. Co-intel pro-like methods, which used to be clandestine, are openly embraced and legitimized by the U.S. government and are directed at anyone who attempts to operationalize the militancy associated with Malcolm X. This backlash has coalesced during the Trump administration and thereafter into a truly fascist threat to the legacy of Malcolm X. This is no more clearly demonstrated than any unprecedented mobilization of black people and their allies in the wake of the racist assassination of George Floyd, but as well in the consequent retrenchment of the police and the coddling of fascist white supremacist terrorists. Let me just stop there. And uh, I look forward to the presentation of the rest of the panel and the questions to come. Thank you, Dr. Sales. What a powerful uh, presentation. Uh, let me just say how um, uh, wonderful it is that we're having this program on Malcolm X today, uh, paradoxically, on the birthday of Huey P. Newton, the founder, co-founder of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. Now, our next uh, panelist is going to be a brother that we all know. Uh, and he has been a student of Malcolm X for many years, but more importantly, he's been a part of organization trying to keep that legacy alive. Let me just read you the short bio here. Zaid Muhammad has a radical activist profile of over 40 years. He is a proud cub of the Black Panther Party and the founding press officer of New York's Malcolm X Commemoration Committee. He was recently featured in the critically acclaimed Netflix documentary, Who Killed Malcolm X? He is the organizer for NCAP, 
Newark Communities for Accountable Policing, an umbrella organization for the social justice organizations represented on Newark's groundbreaking new civilian review board over the Newark Police Department. Most recently, he has also become the Newark strategist for Equal Justice USA, playing a role in their violence reduction efforts. He is an associate producer for All Politics Are Local weekly hip hop talk radio show based at Rutgers University, Newark. He is a stage actor and poet currently working on two volumes of poetry, The Soul Poems, Offerings of Love and Rage, and We Ride, Malcolm X, The Black Panther Party, and Those Who Dare to hair. <laughs> because of his fatherly bearing, young people have taken to calling him Baba Zaid. Baba means father in Yoruba. With no further delay, our friend and comrade Zaid Muhammad. Pointed with purpose of my generation's eyes, I am here sword sharp slashing through your mountains of lies. Coming right at you as serious as cancer, I am the one refusing to be your well-paid buck dancer, leaping from the shoulders of the baddest of panthers. I am the X, as in Malcolm, and the answer. Just thought I'd change the energy up a little bit, y'all. Uh, coming behind my big brother, William Sales, is a tall, tall task. I want everybody to give us a round of applause for that brother Stella, thoroughly layered presentation that he just gave us. On. We could actually close the damn meeting right now and we'd be good based on what Bill did. And I want to really, just before I really get into what I want to say, I want to thank everybody who was in this mix trying to make these offerings today. Bill's shoulders are important for us to appreciate. What he did twofold especially with the Malcolm X speaks in the 90s conference was electric and institutionally profound in honoring defending and upholding Malcolm's legacy right and I, I I've been trying in my modest way with my, my modest means to try and uh, lay the groundwork to get folks to talk about doing something comparable for 2025 this year is the seventh year of the International Decade for People of African Descent that will end in 2024, dealing with Malcolm's Pan-Africanism, right? But the 25 will mark Malcolm's centennial. And those of us who are trying to uphold this particular legacy that this man took 19 bullets for on February 21st, there's some things we need to be serious about trying to do. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can inspire another generation of scholars to, to step forward with that. And I'm, I know the elder, this is, it was, and, and, and that, that those conferences in, in 1990 weren't just bourgeois scholars. These were scholars who were in the trenches, organically involved in our struggle. Bill Sales was organically involved in our struggle coming out of the black student movement. He was a scholar that should have gotten the task should have gotten a task to do that epic biography on Malcolm based on Malcolm's papers at Columbia University, but was instead given to somebody else who disgraced Malcolm's legacy and disgraced the black radical tradition with that obscene, foul, horribly ahistoric piece that he did and that is uh, Manning Maribel, may he rest in piss. I'm not going to bite my tongue on that. What that man did with all that he had at his disposal was betrayal of our struggle and of the black radical tradition and its scholarly tradition. We need to be clear about that and understand who is on our side when we raise this class war for our liberation, right? 
Kelly Harris and Todd Burroughs represent another generation of black scholars coming forward. Kelly, Har Kelly Harris is an unapologetic keeper of the flame of the black radical tradition. And I'm not going to get into what he's going to say because I can anticipate what he's going to say. And I want to appreciate Todd on a couple of levels. This year will mark the 30th anniversary of the epic flick for all of its pluses and minuses that was the Malcolm X Spike Lee film. When young Todd Burroughs was at the Star Ledger, Todd saw to it that those of us who stepped to Spike Lee, now that's what we did. I mean, we actually went to his place when it was open in front of his fans who stepped to Spike Lee, saying that you are not going to sterilize, commercialize, or trivialize Malcolm's legacy with this contract that you got with Hollywood. There's some things that need to happen and there's some things that better not happen. And as a consequence of us stepping to Spike Lee, who had already put together a horrible script that was given to us by the Underground Railroad before it came out, right? That showed us just how filthy and petty where he was going, honoring the contract that he signed, he all of a sudden had to come forward, talk to some black millionaires and say, you know, I need some money to clean this thing up. And so whatever value we have from that film, that's a consequence of our struggle, honoring Malcolm's legacy and holding our people accountable who betray us by virtue of their class privilege. Right? So Todd, I want Join to the meeting. you for what you shared at the Star Ledger, saying to it that Amiri Baraka and I who were on the Jersey side of that fight, got some fair play in the press. So I just had to lay that out because that's important to appreciate. So Todd also, right? Todd also is the co-editor of an important book that needs valuable appreciation. Him and Jared Ball's uh, 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 The Lie of Invention, correcting Matting Maribel, needs to be appreciated. There were two scholarly responses of an anthology kind. That Manning Maribel's thing was so pathetic. And Kelly is, is featured in the other one, the one that was co-edited by her boy in Maulana Karinga. Uh, that, that too needs to be appreciated. Malcolm Real, not imagined by any means necessary. So I'm looking forward to what those young men have to say and just honored to be in this, in this thing. I want to go forward and, you know, some of the other things that I've been associated with that also need some cleaning up. You know, Hollywood through Netflix and other mediums are trying to rediscover Malcolm, right? Who Killed Malcolm X was six episodes. Six episodes. A lot of resources of, of something that could have gotten a whole lot deeper and been a whole lot clearer about what Malcolm's life and death truly meant. It didn't go as far as it should have because it was beholden on two class Negroes, Manning Maribel's book and uh, 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 Henry Lewis Skip uh, W.E.B. Du Bois Gates uh, and, and, and their limitations and their uh, concern for their own place in class privilege as commercial scholars, because that's when the end what they are proving themselves to be, right? That film, when it came to my presentation, I want to make you plan, make it plan on what I was trying to get them to see and do. I was trying to get them to see that New, New Jersey was a hell of a lot more than those fools that actually went into the Autobahn ballroom from New, from Mars 25, that took Malcolm out. That that was not the real story. That's part of the story, but the real story was what did Malcolm's life mean? What, did, what was the impact of Malcolm's life on cities like Newark? Let us remember, right here in Newark, when Amiri Baraka put us on the stage of history, the whole world looked at Newark for what Black power looked like, for what Black liberation looked like, for what cultural revolution looked like, and what the trinity of the Black liberation movement looks like, self-determination, self-respect, and self-defense. Amiri made Newark the center of our attention globally, standing on Malcolm's shoulders, right? So we need to appreciate that. That needs to be cleared up. This last piece, this last piece that came out with the exoneration, finally, of those two brothers who were in the Nation of Islam that got framed, 
trying to let the New York City Police Department off the hook ain't happening on this watch. The New York City Police Department, not just a, a J. Edgar Hoover, uh, may he rest in piss, and they're trying to individualize history to make it conveniently commercial, is responsible for Malcolm de- Malcolm's death. The New York City Police Department facilitated the assassination of Malcolm X. The New York City Police Department knew Malcolm's life was being threatened threatened on a regular basis. The New York City Police Department participated in going to the press and trying to say that Malcolm was just hungry for media and trying to minimize the value of those threats. The New York City Police Department planted a a Molotov cocktail in Malcolm's home after it was firebombed and tried to do the very thing of the very day that his home was firebombed and one of those firebombs came in the bedroom of his baby girls. The New York City Police Department was a part of that. The New York City Police Department did not just have two Negroes, Gene Roberts and Ray Wood, uh, undercover in, in, the, in that ballroom. It was full of it was full of informants. And the New York City Police Department should have, at the very least, in the interest of the people, because when you you know you prosecute somebody for crime, it's not a, an individual doing it, it's the people versus whoever the criminal is. In the interest of the people, at the very least on February 21st, there should have been a uniform call in presence at the Autobahn Ballroom. They deliberately did not do that and uh, arrested several of Malcolm's key cadre to make sure that Malcolm would be as, as defenseless as he was when that happened. And I want to shout out an ancestor who does not get any play in this in terms of Malcolm's assassination that we need to appreciate. And this is Brother Reuben X. Francis. I wrote an article several years ago. Brother Reuben didn't get the memo. And there's a the story goes that Malcolm did not uh, want anyone uh, armed or searched on those last several meetings at the autobahn, right? And most of the brothers heeded that uh, order. Brother Reuben didn't get the memo using uh, business language, and on that fateful day, he was armed. And doing what a soldier is supposed to do in an act of war under those circumstances, it was Reuben Francis who popped Talmadge Hale. And that's the only reason Talmadge Hale was captured, because Reuben dropped him. And had he not dropped him, every last one of those men who participated in Malcolm's assassination would have gotten away scot-free, aided and abetted by the New York City Police Department. They don't get off on this. They don't get off on this. We need to be clear that that when our people, when our people comes under the scrutiny and the attack of the state, it is not just the FBI. It is all of the arms and, and the instruments of the national security state. And we need not minimize the place of our local police departments. New York City Police Department's boss branch was one of the uh, best covert operating uh, forces in in in. in law enforcement in the country at the time, and it behaved as such in facilitating the assassination of Malcolm X. I could go on and on. I'll close with this because I love, because one of the things I want to lay out, and Bill laid it out in his book, in his lecture, but I'm going to use Kwame's language to, to end what I'm going to say, and then I just a few remarks on our political prisoners. When Malcolm was assassinated, his blood fertilized the transformation of the movement. And so you saw this explosion of a range of profoundly liberating. Join the meeting. The Black Liberation Movement looks like inspired by Malcolm, the Black Panther Party, the Congress of African People, uh, all of those organizations uh, that that, uh, Bill laid out, all of those expressions. Was the, that, that represented the range of Malcolm's impact and the range of what he embodied with his legendary Ville persona and his discipline and his uh, 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 an ordinary, extraordinary capacity to organize, organize uh, and mobilize with his great uh, charismatic gifts. And let us remember also that he was indeed a tremendous organizer. He was just getting ready to put troops on the ground to organize what the OAAU was beco- was becoming. That's why they took him when they took him, because it was his organizing prowess that made the Nation of Islam 
an organization of only about five or six miles when he came out of prison in 1952 and quadrupled their ranks by virtue of the work that he put in using the cadre method vis-a-vis nation style to build that organization for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So let us appreciate him in that. And I will not leave this without speaking up for our political prisoners and our prisoners of war. Today is indeed the birthday of the unconquerable Huey P. Newton. Today is also the anniversary of the passing of Khalid Abdul Muhammad, someone who I proudly work with, and I'll never apologize for, as some Negroes continue to apologize for Khalid's virile presence, no matter how limited or misunderstood he was. He was a genuine Bologoon, a genuine black power general that had a love and respect for his people. But Huey's legacy in the party, we still have dozens of political prisoners languish in, in, in these prisons, but here, in New Jersey, we have a particular responsibility to rally around Sundi Ada Okoli, Asada's co-defendant. There's a whole lot of young folks running around talking about Asada's class. I don't talk, don't you can't talk about Asada without talking about her comrade Sundi Ada. We have a full-fledged campaign pushing for Sundi Ada's release. Sundi is now 80 five years old, 85, been in prison since 1973, since that fateful day on the turnpike on, on May 2nd, 1973, right? He's been cleared for parole since several times since 1994. He has done his time. Done his time. And it's on us to do what we need to do to freedom. I want everybody to look up the Bring Sundiata Akoli Home Alliance. Plug into that. We're trying to get 25 letters to go to Governor Murphy, and we got a postcard campaign. Most of this campaign has drawn support from outside of New Jersey. Time has come for Jersey folks to rally around Sundiata Akoli, right? 85 years old in prison for 49 years, barely survived having COVID in prison. Jersey released folks uh, on, on the question of COVID. They didn't release Sundiata. He should have been one of the first released. So we have to do whatever's necessary. Todd, I see you dropping that in the chat. Thank you, son. I appreciate that, little brother. Right? Uh, bring Sundiata Akoli Alliance. Bring the Sundiata, bring the Sundiata Akoli Home Alliance. Check that out. Get involved. Plug it in. If you don't have that, y'all know how to how to reach me. The hashtag for all the young heads rocking this is hashtag bring Sundiata home. All power to the people. X is the answer. Free the land. Long live Malcolm X. Carry on the tradition. Be clear on the shoulders we stand on. Honor our ancestors the way they ought to be honored. I am my ancestors. X is the answer. Thank you, Brother Zaid Muhammad. What an excellent presentation. Um, passionate and informative. Next, we're going to bring forward um, our next panelist, uh, who I have known for many years also. In fact, I think he was around at the time of the birth of the People's Organization for Progress. I think at that time he was still writing for the Afro-American under the editorship of Deborah Smith Gregory, who is now the president of the NAACP. Let me read uh, his bio. Todd Stephen Burroughs, PhD, is an independent researcher and writer based in Newark, New Jersey. He has taught with an Africana studies focus at Howard University, Morgan State University, Seton Hall University, the University of Michigan at Dearborn, and Wayne State University. He has written for The Source, Color Lines, Black Issues Book Review, The Crisis, BlackAmericaWeb.com, TheRoot.com, The New York Amsterdam News, the New Jersey edition of the Afro-American newspaper chain, The Star Ledger, and the NNPA News Service. During the time the latter nation's only newswire for black newspapers, Burrow is the author of Warrior Princess, a people's biography 
of Ida B. Wells and Marvel's Black Panther, a comic book biography from Stan Lee to Tana Easy Coates, both published by Diasporic Africa Press. His I Mix What I Like dot org audiobook, Sunshine on Cracked Sidewalks, deals with the 2014 mayoral election of Ross Baraka. He is the co-author with Herb Boyd of Civil Rights, Yesterday and Today, and Join the meeting with Dr. Jared A. Ball, full professor at the Department of Africana Studies at Morgan State University, of A Lie of Reinvention, Correcting Manning Marable's Malcolm X. In 2022, his book-length essay, The Invisible Shadow and the High Top Fade, The Mortal Cells of America's Political Prisoners, Freedom's Untouchables, can also be found at imixwhatilike.org. Burroughs edited anthology, The Trials of Mia Abu Jamal, a biography in 25 voices, is set to be published this spring, also by Diasporic Africa Press. POP, POP's Zaid Muhammad, who just spoke, did that book's forward. So without any further delay, our brother and friend and comrade, Todd Burroughs. Thank you, uh, Adima Changa. Um, a couple of things before I start. Um, I, I, I pissed Larry off last year when I said this. I'm going to piss him off again. I'm going to take 10 minutes maximum on this, right? Because talking to y'all about Malcolm X is ridiculous. It, it just is, right? But let me, let me just say a couple of things really quick. First, I just want to do a general correction. I started at the Afro in 1985. Uh, Deborah Smith, my journalism teacher at Upward Bound, Seton Hall Upward Bound, got me involved. The editor back then was somebody I don't want us to forget. Bob Queen, who gave me my first press pass. And Bob Queen uh, was a legend in, in New Jersey and Philadelphia journalism, black journalism. I do not want him forgotten. So I just wanted to make that, that gentle uh, correction. The other thing I want to say is that I only have one goal in 2022. And I think because they finally have gotten it together, I don't have to worry about this goal. Now, this goal has nothing to do with the book that I'm coming out with, Mumia Abu Jamal. It has nothing to do with that. My goal for 2022 is to make sure that Annette Austin and Larry Hand finish the autobiography of Larry Hand. I know you, you're pissed off, Larry. I know you're pissed off. It's at a publisher right now. And I want them to finish it right now so that it comes out before the National Black Political Convention. Everyone, everyone I talk to, yes, thank you, Larry. Everyone I talk to in Newark, when I mention that I know the author of the autobiography of Larry Hamm, Annette Austin, when I, when I, when I um, say that, their eyes pop up. When, when I mention Larry Hamm's going to come on autobiography, their eyes pop up. I talked to a principal today, their eyes pop up, right? People are waiting for this book. I want to say that. I want to say that. Now, um, let me be a bit serious and take about eight minutes and, and say something very brief, but something that I think is important to say. Today, um, as you said, uh, uh, Brother Ham is the birthday of, uh, of Huey P. Newton. And I think it's very important to talk about Huey P. Newton because when I think about Huey P. Newton on this day, I think about a day in 1968 where there was a huge Huey P. Newton rally, Huey P. Newton birthday rally in Oakland. And this was one of the heights of the Black Power Movement before uh, Gary, Indiana. And Stokely Carmichael and H. Rap Brown, leaders of the Black Power Movement, were named honorary Panthers that day. So it was a very strong and powerful and radical day. It was Saturday. Now, the reason that day is important to me is kind of selfish. I was born that day. Mm. And I always tell people on my birthday today, that I was born that day, because I'm very proud that that is the day that I came here. Uh, so that, that day is really important to me. 
So today was a day of, of, of reflection and, and I'm still dealing with this news that has not yet been confirmed. So please do not get upset uh, if, it's, if it's not true, hopefully it is not true. But I, I've just, you know, there's been some reports about Askia Muhammad of WPFW and WBAI transitioning into ancestry. Mm. And I don't know whether that is true or not. Uh, but I wanted, but, but I spent a lot of tonight trying to, to deal with that. So what I wanted to, to talk to you about, now that I've done this kind of introduction, what I wanted to talk to you about is just some brief things that I think are important to say about Malcolm X. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what John Henry Clark would talk about and going around the subject to getting to the subject. So I'm going to, being that I'm literally the generation that Sesame Street was created for, Mr. Rogers and I are premiered in, in, in the same week in the world in 1968, in February 1968, right? I'm going to talk about some seeds, right? And before we get to the X, all right? So this is going to link up. So just, just be a bit patient. I don't know if many of you got to see the uh, funeral today of Amir Locke. I got to see it. Now, when we talk about the legacy of Malcolm X, see, we, we're talking about how Black people today are so afraid to say what they really want to say. And they've, been, they've taught themselves to be contained and not really, not really go where they want to go, right? So watching one of these funerals is always a very painful process for me because I see Black people struggling against themselves. I see them wanting to embrace the revolutionary Christianity that I know they believe, that what Nat Turner believed, but they don't want to say that publicly. They don't want to go there, right? But let me tell you, Amir Rock's aunt got the closest to saying what she really wanted to say because she talked about... Um, how there was going to be a reckoning. Now, she put it in Christian terms, but I, I kept hearing David Walker's appeal in her voice. And see, we don't want to mention David Walker's appeal because then we got to mention how David Walker died in a mysterious circumstance. Okay? So we, we don't talk about courage because we, we, because we then we have to talk about consequence. Right? These are the seeds I'm dealing with right now, right? So then she also says, Quoting Malcolm X, and then everybody went, ooh. <laughs> and I was like, what's, what's she going to say about Malcolm X? What's she going to say about Malcolm X? Because you don't hear Malcolm X quoted in, in these places, right? And now, of course, she quoted about the chickens coming home the roost. I said, okay, all right, she's, she's quoting that. All right, that's, that's fine. That's that reckoning, right? So she, she wants to say, she wants to say that we got to get and, and do it, but she can't, she can't do it. She's restrained by the propriety of the moment. She's restrained by the Christianity she's been taught. Unfortunately, she hasn't been taught the kind of Christianity that Nat Turner knows and that, you know, I mean, Malcolm X's favorite song, he said, was praise the Lord and pass the ammunition, right? So people, but the people don't want to go there. They're afraid. And see, I think we need to talk about if we're going to talk about Malcolm X, we need to talk about acts of courage. Now, acts of courage can be quite small. For example, there's a man named Dr. Kelly Harris, who has the unfortunate circumstance of having me as one of his professors. <laughs> now, why am I saying that? Because every semester, the Black students get mad and go to the dean and, and just talk about me like a dog and want me out of Seton Hall. And I literally had to just quell a revolt that the black students had at Wayne State University. I had to quell a revolt. I had to sit for three hours with the chair. Now, what what is what has made all these black students want me out? Well, I had this thing, y'all, about not coddling Generation Z, about telling them they're going to read books, books plural, and if they don't like it, they can take another class. I mean, I, I had the tendency to do that, and so Dr. Kelly Harris has shown courage that I want to publicly acknowledge. Why? Because he is not yet tenure track. So every time these students complain, that's a strike against him. And they're about to complain again because I got I to teach the Martin Luther King scholars in person next week. And this time next week, they're going to be storming out the classroom and going to complain. So this is going to happen next week. I'm not only telling you about the, about the recent past, 
I'm telling you about the future as well. For Kelly Harris to continue to have me there is an act of courage. And it shows his commitment to a place he has only learned about for five years. He's only known us for about five years. But look at how serious he is. He's proven that by every semester, somehow I get more classes to teach and it's continues to happen, right? So courage can be in small ways, but courage can also be in large ways. I wrote a whole book about some people who were courageous, a whole on, online book about political prisoners. And I point out that we all know that a brick thrown correctly would have saved George Floyd's life. We're all standing on, we're, stand, we're all standing on right, not just the people at that corner of Minneapolis, we're all standing on that corner pretending to not know what to do. Pretending that we don't know how to throw a brick. Whereas 50 years ago, we would have just thrown a brick, Chauvin would have gotten up, and George Floyd would have been alive. But we're so afraid of what is going to happen to us. And I'm glad that Zaid mentioned political prisoners because the political prisoners are literally the generation who threw the brick. And that's why I wanted to honor them by writing my version of Between the World and Me, my version of ta Coates, but I wanted to make it about them so that we understand what courage and commitment is. Yes, we need to rally around. I'm going to see Zaid Muhammad right now. We need to rally around Kelly, and the students should be demanding what the Concern 44 demanded, restoring a full-fledged African Studies program with professors with full tenure. That's correct, Zaid. Yes. Now, we have courage, we have commitment, so we have these C's, and so let's go toward the X, and then I'll, I'll exit. When we deal with Malcolm X, we deal with someone who did more than just give an analysis, which is what we're all now addicted to doing, particularly on social media. We're dealing with someone who actually went to Africa to try to organize all of the Africans against the West. Now, anybody needs proof on that? You can read the diary of Malcolm X, written by, I mean, edited by her boy, Yasser Shabazz. Makes, makes it very clear. So this whole Peniel Joseph bullshit about, oh, Malcolm X was a critic of American democracy. Malcolm X didn't care about American democracy. Malcolm X cared about world African revolution. And we need to always make that distinction because the problem that I'm facing as a professor of this Generation Z is that there are no longer distinctions. People think everybody's on equal footing. People think everybody's equal. People think Barack Obama and Michelle Obama are equal to King and Coretta. They think that why? because they've never been given distinction. See, what's gonna what's gonna what's gonna drop us is not um, information, but knowledge, lack of knowledge. And then what's gonna drop us, as Raul Peck says, is that he says it's not knowledge that we lack; it's the commitment to have courage. Like he says that in the, in, in the epigraph, his documentary series on Western imperialism. So we have a two pronged problem. What we have to show, in summary is Malcolm X's harsh analysis of the United States and of Western imperialism and his action to organize to either stop it or to overthrow it. And if we do that, then I think we're honoring Malcolm X. And that was like 13 minutes. So I think that was pretty good. So I'm, I'm going to let uh, other folks uh, continue. But thank you very much. You guys, I, as I, as I t tag people, Pop keeps dragging me in this Malcolm X program every year. That's, that's my complaint, right? But I really enjoyed uh, uh, saying that. And thank you so much for allowing me to do so. And Zaid, again, as I I'm going to tell you publicly what I told you privately. Your, your essay looks fantastic in the galleys of this book. And I want to congratulate you on a wonderful introduction to this Mumia book. 
You guys should be very proud of Zaid because he did this while doing 15 other things. And you should be very proud of Annette, which has made it really her life's work over the last three years to get this book out, Mary Ham. So you, so Bob, you've got some people in here you really need to be proud of and you need to celebrate and congratulate. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs. Malcolm X cared about world revolution. That's, that's something to think about. I'm, I'm going to think about that. I can't disagree with it. I just want to give um, a shout out to Dr. Forrest Pritchett, uh, who we will hear from on another date. Uh, because we hear from Dr. Pritchett uh, uh, sometime this spring. And uh, Dr. Pritchett has, has opened the path for many of us to come up and interact with the students at Seton Hall University. Um, our last speaker on the panel, before we open it up to questions and answers and comments, will be the one who has been discussed by the previous two speakers. And that's our brother, Dr. Kelly Harris, who has been an active supporter of the People's Organization for Progress uh, for some time now. But let me read uh, his brief biographical outline that he sent us. You ain't got to read that. <laughs> Just, I'm no, good to I go. Read, I read everybody else's. I'm going to read yours. You, you can't stop me. <laughs> Dr. Kelly Harris is the director of Africana Studies and teaches Africana studies at Seton Hall University. Areas of expertise include black politics, black political thought, African-American history, and of social science. Recent publications are Hidden Figures, Black Women, Bridge Leaders, and Coalition Building, forthcoming book chapter with Roseanne Mirabella, the search for a black political science, the epistemology and relevance of Mac Jones in the National Political Science Review and number 45 in the persistence of white nationalism in Not Our President, New Directions from the Pushed Out, the Others and the Clear Majority in Trump's Stolen America. He is currently working on a manuscript, Quicksand, the Slow Demise of Black Alternatives to American Social Science, which wrestles with Black social scientists, genealogy, and attempts to transform American social science. In addition to the manuscript, he is currently writing an article on F. Hammurabi Rob, who was a pioneer grassroots Chicago Africana historian our brother, our friend, and our comrade, Dr. Kelly Harris. Thank you, uh, 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 Chairman Ham. Thank you, Todd, for the kind words. Um, thank you, Dr. Sales and Baba Zaid and Todd for your presentation. Uh -huh. And, you know, it, it, it really is an august uh, 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 presenters that I'm following. Um, and this, I say this without any hyperbole, Dr. Sales, uh, Baba Zaid, and, and Todd, uh, are three are amongst the most knowledgeable scholars on Malcolm X in the country. Um, and we would include with that uh, Baba Zach, Kondo, Paul Lee, um, and some others. Um, but at any rate, I'm going to go pretty quick on my presentation. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I want to go through a PowerPoint, and there's a couple points that I uh, want to hit on in this PowerPoint. So forgive me for talking fast, but I want to get through the presentation. Uh, let me enlarge my screen. As its name hints, around 1900, the lower Porsche Mixta was the first car that gained popularity 100 years later. Steve All right. So uh, the, the picture you see here, that's as Londa Robeson. Now, the reason I include this, that's actually, I couldn't find a picture of her mother. Uh, but as Londa Good as her mother, her mother was in Hubert Harrison's Liberty League. And a part of that Liberty League was also Marcus Garden. 
and Madam C.J. Walker and some other Harlem activists. So when we start off thinking about Malcolm X and his genealogy, of course we think about his parents, but we have to think, and we think about the Garvey movement, but we have to think also about Hubert Harrison, who was called the Black Socrates, uh, who coined the term race first and who was a leading black socialist, uh, at the leading black socialist at that time. So we have to remember that. But of course his parents were Garveyites, but one thing that I wanna point out that people may not know, um, that his mother joined the UNIA before his father did. His mother joined in Canada. Um, and then his father joined in Georgia and then moved to Canada for a brief time. And that's where they met and got married. But she was already a member of the UNIA. Her uncle, Edgerton Lang Langdon in, in Canada, was also a UNIA member. That's how she got involved in the UNIA, right? Um, we know that the first Pan-African Congress was 1919, right before my, uh, Malcolm was born. Uh, you can't see it in this picture, but right where my cursor is, you see W.E.B. Du Bois there in the middle. And you see the makeup of the folk here over in France during this. We have the UNIA's 1920 International Convention, uh, which his parents were at. I know. Which his parents were at in 1920. All right. <laughs> this is right before they moved. Um, Thank you. Super smart. Oh, uh, you should be able to be at the other part. Quiet, please. We are turn your stuff off. Thank you. All right. So we have the Declaration, the Negro World, Declaration of Rights of People of the Negro World. So this Pan-Africanism, this human rights struggle, uh, Garvey uh, uh, and the UNIA was on it in the 1920s, right? And we see Garvey even in exile, uh, sent a petition of the Negro races to the League of Nations detailing human rights abuses against people of African descent. Right, so when we think about Malcolm and his development, his trajectory, he's standing on some serious shoulders. We have George Patmore, um, uh, and I put this here, and, and, and Dr. Sales, and uh, probably would, would would know this as much as anybody. I put this here because when Malcolm goes to Ghana, when we see in Ghana, Patmore is in Ghana as an advisor and a writer for Kwame and Krum. Right, um, very influential in the direction of Kwame and Krum. We see Marcus Garvey's first wife um, in London um, having these uh, salons, cultural salons, where they're having these discussions about Pan-Africanism. And there you see, uh, you have the CLR James, George Padmore, Yomo Kenyatta, uh, 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 and many others who are part of that parlor. Here we see, of course, Elijah Muhammad being arrested, incarcerated in 1942. That's kind of tangential to what I'm trying to do now, but I just wanted to point that out to people so it's for a uh, little historical context so we understand where we're at. Malcolm in his prison years, before his prison years, 1941 to 1946. But here's the key thing, and this is an interesting article that I'm going to send to uh, Ingrid and Larry to share with people. Um, the article does not talk about a lot. Malcolm X during his prison years. Now, I'm going to pause here for a second because Dr. John Henry Clark had said a long time ago that Malcolm was much more well-read than people give him credit for before he joined the Nation of Islam, right? So Malcolm X during his prison years, before he joined the nation, before he joined the nation, one of the things that this author points out in this article is that Malcolm was very literate, and we ought to deal with Malcolm in his autobiography. I'm going to get to that point in a second. But Malcolm was uh, very literate, literate. He was eloquent. He took classes in German and Latin. He got a, uh, a certificate in English. He took college courses. He did all these things, right? And he was a fierce debater, right? And a lot of that he did before he even joined the Nation of Islam. And even and this is his first year at Charleston. He was taking these classes, right? So and he came in writing letters, and he was even working on an autobiography. Right? Malcolm was working, writing, this is what he told his sister Ellen. Malcolm was writing an autobiography in prison in the 1940s, okay? That's an important fact that we have to remember. All right, so what else is um, Malcolm pulling from and looking at? Uh, these precursors, Council on African Affairs, and you see there Paul Robeson, Alphaeus Hutton, and W.E.B. Du Bois, um, who of course were uh, undermined um, by the United States government, a part of its counterintelligence program uh, for the work that they were doing. We see the fifth Pan-African Congress, 1949. Again, Du Bois was the co-chair. 
Uh, Pat Moore and Krumah were co-political secretaries. Yomo Kenyatta was there. Pan-African scholars see this as a watershed moment um, because this is the first time that uh, Africans really led the Pan-African Congress. And this really gave wind beneath their sails for the liberation struggle. The National Negro Congress petitions the UN uh, in 1945. Max Jurgen at the time was the head of the National Negro Congress, but he becomes um, a part of this COINTELPRO uh, operation to undermine folks. So he's an interesting figure. Uh, an appeal to the world submitted by the NAACP to the United Nations in 1945. W.E.B. Du Bois and, and Rayford Logan, uh, the great historian, led that effort. Um, uh, and again, requesting domestic intervention in the United States, looking at the struggle as a human rights struggle, not simply a civil rights struggle. And here we see this executive order by uh, President Truman, known as the Loyalty Order, uh, which outlines subversive uh, organizations in an attempt to undermine. Uh, uh, this is a part of this whole COINTELPRO piece, right? So it's not just the FBI, it's the CIA, it's the, United, it's the, it's the federal government, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, uh, which a lot of African Americans, Mary McLeod Bethune, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, were a part of in pushing for this Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We see Brother Malcolm as he leaves. Uh, his incarceration. One thing to point out, some of the letters that he was sending to Elijah Muhammad were in the hands of the FBI. And we have to think about how they got those letters, right? Those letters that he sent from when he was in prison are in the hands of the FBI. So we have to think about how they got those letters. Was it a prison official that copied the letters and sent? Could be. Was it somebody in the Nation of Islam uh, uh, who interceded and copied it and sent it? Could be. We have to think about that. Um, 1953, we have the American Committee on, on Africa, right? Um, and it's, and it's, there's an interesting uh, uh, disruption I had to say here. Uh, Queen Mother Moore is also saying that she's the one, Malcolm didn't know much about Africa, that she's the one that taught Malcolm a lot about Africa. And there's a lot of research now about the women who inspired Malcolm and the work that they were doing, Queen Mother Moore being being one, Vicki Garvin being another. Vicki Garvin is another one who mentions how, how intelligent Malcolm was um, before he went to prison in New York when him and Red Fox used to sneak into Communist Party meetings to get free food and, and, uh, and, and flirt with the women, right? But Vicki Garvin, even at that time, said Malcolm was so intelligent uh, and sharp. And she was recruiting Malcolm, trying to get Malcolm to join uh, in the struggle at that time. And, and remember, Malcolm was a team, Malcolm was 19. 18, 19 years old when that has happened. Of course, this Bandung conference, what Malcolm said at the time, um, th this conference was the most, uh, uh, the proudest he ever was of people of African descent. Uh, Richard Wright was at that conference uh, as well, of course, wrote about the Bandung conference. Uh, but this is a conference that inspired Malcolm and also a conference where uh, uh, the United States was intent on undermining um, the leaders uh, at that that came out of that conference. Of course, we know Ghana becomes independent in 1957 and a focal point for the CIA um, from that moment on to undermine Kwame Nkrumah. And you see here the CIA reached out to Tom and Boy of, Ken of Kenya and K.A. Badima, who was the uh, financial minister for Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, there's, a, there's a new book out called White Malice um, that gets in a little bit more detail about Tom and Boya. Um, and it claims that even Obama's father, um, who came over in the first airlift of Kenyan students to the United States to go to school, claimed that Obama's father was a CIA asset. Um, could be. I, I haven't read the book yet. So we got, I got to see what kind of evidence the, off, the author uh, provides. Um, but it certainly is uh, an interesting uh, assertion. All right. American Society for African Culture. Now, here's the thing that, that's tricky. So the United States intelligence agencies see how interested it uh, African Americans are becoming in Africa. They're seeing the af activism that African Americans are having in Africa. So the United States CIA says, why don't we sponsor an organization dealing with African culture? Why don't we get ahead of it? And they put a, a black CIA agent, James Ted Harris, as the executive uh, director, assistant executive director of the American Society for African Culture. Um, and the Africans and African Americans who participated in it uh, had no idea um, that the CIA hands was in this organization. All African People's Conference, Winds of Change, 1958. Um, we put this here 
just to see another thing that really is inspiring Malcolm that he's paying attention to that's radicalizing African Americans and Africans here in this country. And what the COINTELPRO would be intent on undermining. Um, here we see Malcolm, of course, with Fidel in 1960. We won't get into detail about this, but one of the things that we know is that this, uh, this meeting also, there was an FBI agent in the meeting, um, unbeknownst to them, um, reporting on what Fidel and Malcolm um, were discussing at that meeting. And a young Carlos Moore was also at that meeting, and that's when Hera, him and Malcolm X uh, met. And then we see this fair play for Cuba um, with Harlem Black nationalists. We see uh, our brother from uh, Newark, uh, Mary Baraka, John Henry Clark, uh, William Worthy, a man that you all should know, uh, a reporter uh, for CBS, Julian Mayfield, someone who the CIA still will not release his file. And we see Carlos Moore. Uh, 1960, of course, we see this fair play in Cuba. There you see at the head of the table, Robert Williams, who had fled to Cuba. You see a Mary Baraka sitting next to him. John Henry Clark standing behind him. Harold Cruz was also there at that, uh, and, and some other uh, luminaries. We could talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, I'm run through this. We see Robert Williams. We'll talk about Robert Williams a little bit more if you want. But Graham was mentioned, um, inspired by Malcolm X, um, Max Stanford, Muhammad Ahmad, you know, he even asked Malcolm to, about joining in the nation. And Malcolm said, brother, well, you'll be better, you know, starting an organization of your own and being a more benefit. And, and uh, Max Stanford started this revolutionary action movement. And Malcolm was an advisor um, and a mentor to Graham and the work they were doing. Um, all right. Malcolm, some of the speeches that you all know very well. Malcolm Breaks the Nation, 1964. Malcolm in Ghana, we noticed he, uh, Maya Angelou was there, Vicky Garvin was there, Julia Mayfield was there, right? Jo uh, George Pablo wasn't there at the time. Um, 1964, this meeting, this is the meeting where Malcolm meets with civil rights activists at Sydney Portier and Juanita Portier's home. And this is where this meeting was also re uh, recorded by the FBI, uh, where they say the most dangerous thing to come out of that meeting uh, was Malcolm X uh, plan for taking the United States um, uh, on charges at the United Nations on human rights violations, right? Uh, Ozzie Davis was there. Clarence Mitchell, you see standing here, was Dr. King's lawyer and friend and confidant. He was there. He took the idea to back to Dr. King. Dr. King loved the idea. Allegedly, they were supposed to work on it together, right? Two weeks later, Dr. King, uh, uh, one, one scholar says there was a recording of Dr. King uh, calling Malcolm X, but uh, he's the only scholar that says that, so nobody else has heard that. Maybe that'll be in the information dump that's supposed to come in five years of recordings on Dr. King, so keep your eyes on that. June 7, July 17, 1964, Malcolm addresses the OAU, OAU in Cairo. Your problems will never be solved until and unless ours are solved in the United States. This is a world problem, a problem for humanity, a problem of human rights. Here's an important piece, December 11, 1964. Now, Malcolm was trying to get an African country to sponsor a bill, or, or not a bill, to sponsor a statement charging the United States with human rights violations. Nobody did it. But Che Guevara gave this speech in 1964. And I want to read this because it's important. And that's why those of those who use the name of the United Nations to commit the murder of Lumumba are today in the name of the defense of the white race murdering thousands of Congolese. But he, he's even more important. The United States intervene, intervenes in Latin America invoking the defense of free institutions. The time will come when this assembly will acquire greater maturity and demand of the United States government guarantees for the life of the blacks and Latin Americans who live in that country, most of them United States citizens, citizens by origin or adoption. Those who will kill their own children and discriminate daily against them because of the color of their skin. Those who left the murderers, who let the murderers of blacks remain free, protecting them and furthermore punishing the black population because they demand their legitimate rights as free men. How can those who do this consider themselves guardians of freedom? Powerful statement. This is exactly what Malcolm wanted. Three days later, now look at the date. That's December 11. Three days later. Chase sends a, a, a note to Malcolm's organization and that reads, 
that ends with united, we will win. Right? According to Carlos Moore, by February 1965, the OAU, Malcolm had recruited 100 black militants to fight with Che Guevara uh, uh, in the Congo, a part of, with, with the Cuban Internationalist Brigade, right? And finally, these are some of the organizations that were inspired uh, by Malcolm X. Oftentimes, people forget this. People talk about, well, Malcolm didn't sponsor any, he didn't inspire any legislation, uh, but Malcolm... The, what he left in terms of the black power, the organizations that he inspired has, has a lasting, long lasting uh, 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 mark on our culture. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm done. Sorry for talking so fast, but I wanted to get it out the way. All right. So one of the, I, I, I want to start and I want to really ask Dr. Sales, Baba Zai, and Dr. Burroughs. Marable's book has a lot of problems. But one thing that's interesting about Marable that, that I'm really coming to, to, to really wonder about, he asked the question, whose book is this? In terms of Alec, the, his autobiography, is it Haley's book or is it his book? Because there are a lot of things in there and I wonder, because Malcolm never saw the finished product. Malcolm never saw the finished product. So we know that Mal Malcolm was never in solitary confinement, never. And he says that in the autobiography. So why is that said? Why is it not said how much he read and he learned in, in, in the classes he took? Why is that not in the autobiography? Why is his mother's whole history not in the autobiography? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. So is it is it his book? Is it Haley's book? So that's a, that's a question I think Marable leaves us with that, that's, that's valuable. So uh, thank well, you. Let's, 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 thank if, you. If I thank can. You, thank you. Okay, hold, hold up. Hold up. Respond. <laughs> Hold up. We're going to um, open the. Well, let, first of all, Dr. Harris, what a powerful presentation. You, di you didn't see me, but I fell out my chair several times <laughs> during the course of your presentation because you had some stuff Load there that I had never seen, brother. So it was an excellent, excellent presentation, as were all the presentations by the panelists. Now we're going to uh, open it up. If, if Italia Armstrong is on this call, Italia, if you stay on after the question and answers, I will invite you to say a word about your uh, campaign uh, uh, there in Trenton. But now we're going to open the floor. Uh, I will let the uh, panelists uh, respond to Doc. I will not let, I will invite the panelists to respond to Dr. Harris and then those who want to make a comment or ask a question, please use the stack protocol that we use during the pop meetings uh, for people to speak. So Brother Zaid Muhammad, you wanted to be the first up to respond to Kelly. I, I think Kelly's question is very important, right? And, and, and Kelly's question that he raises about the autobiography is as important a question as what we did in terms of the fight for the in some integrity with Malcolm's film that Spike did, right? Um, and, and I'll put it this way, for all of the limitations of the autobiography, right? For all of the efforts to censor and control the autobiography, and they were real, right? They were very real, right? Uh, I picked that book up in a drug transaction in 1977, and it still saved my life. And it still saved my life. So Malcolm is a transcendent figure in our history, in spite of all these efforts, to sterilize, you know, commercialize and minimize his impact. He transcends it in spite of all of that bullshit, right? Not, not only does all of those questions that Kelly raised about the particulars of, of the book, three chapters that we have now, right, of Malcolm outlining his thought and what would be some of his most important presentations, message to the grassroots, ballot of the bullet, and the so-called last message, well, those were chapters that were also not allowed to come in. Right, and we have those. So, so the question is a very serious question, uh, and I just think I just thank the God of our ancestors that Malcolm had that kind of aura with who he was and what he left us that he was able to transcend. You know, and, and there's there's and there's no sterilizer like like capitalism, and there's no capitalist like American capitalism, right? So I, I just I just wanted to to say that about Malcolm's mother. She was multilingual. 
She was a bad Garveyite. And she made those kids, those kids were fully well-read as children, even before the state broke them up. She was an amazing black woman. She was a part of the UNI's underground and actually hit Garvey out of himself at critical times in, in all of their lives. She was an amazing black woman, right? We just lost. I was in the process, and this is my work with the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee, right? We've had an ongoing virtual series. I've had, I've had uh, everybody uh, that, that's with us tonight on those panels, right? We were in the process of trying to bring Alice Wyndham on. Alice Wyndham was in Ghana in, with that mix of all those Afro-Americans who were working with Kwame Nkrumah, right? And they were at formed a Ghana chapter of the OAAU. Sure. And those pictures that we see of Malcolm in Ghana, those are Alice Wyndham's pictures. Alice just passed away on February 10th and broke my heart at 85 years old because we were just getting, we really wanted to do a serious sit down with her and let her tell that story and all the related stories about her own struggle and her own contribution to struggle because she too is a powerful, extraordinary woman in the black radical tradition that, that Malcolm loved and, 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 and cherished and had a lot to do with making the work move with him. And then Maya, I, you know, I always raise up Maya too. A lot of people don't realize that Maya was in the process of leaving the leaving Ghana to come back to the United States to help Malcolm organize the OAU on the ground when he was assassinated. And she doesn't stop. She she rolls she rolls south and tries to help Dr. King and takes on a responsibility for the Southern Christian leadership in the North. And Martin gets killed on her birthday. Maya is known for writing her way out of the trauma of being sexually abused as the child. She went through a, a second trauma when Martin was killed on her birth, and it took her years to write herself out of that, right? So there are a lot of amazing women in, in Malcolm's life that definitely need to be lifted up. I want to lift up my elder comrade in the Black Panther Party, Rosemary Miller, who not only did that important document on Malcolm, in Fidel's meeting, right? And that was a cornerstone of those Malcolm X speaks in the 90s conferences that Bill organized, right? But she also has been of late trying that the women in, in Malcolm's life, the women of Malcolm's time also got their proper due in the say and the flow uh, of history. So I just wanted to, to lift them up. All right. Anyone else from the panel? Want to respond to uh, Dr. Harris' question? Going once, going twice, gone. All right, we're going to open it up to our viewers and listeners. Uh, do you have any questions uh, for the panelists? Use the stack method, please. You may have to unmute yourself. I don't believe we have a pop meeting and nobody. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. I have that been an excellent <laughs> <laughs> Susan okay. Chad. And John, John for ahead, the stack. Yeah. Ben John. As we, All right. Greetings, everyone. People's Organization for Progress. As I um, read um, the autobiography of Malcolm X, I kind of said to myself, this man was a true, true, uh, you know, feminist. I mean, you know, think about what he did, uh, brothers and sisters. He loved women so much, right, that he went against all to, to expose um, what had happened in the organization. Now, he could have set up like a lot of men would have set up and kept it in the organization. But he, you know, I mean, that's why I, I just feel so dear to Malcolm X that he went above and beyond to let people know that, you know, what was going on was not right. Now, he could have shut his mouth and shut up about the whole thing, but the fact that he had all women in his, his household, all his children were women, and, and I think it really got to the core of him when that happened that it, it just truly got to him. So when I think of him, I think about how he gave up that for women. 
And and that's how much my respect goes out to that man. If it was a me too moment, that was a me too moment. And that's the question I have. Can I respond to that? Sure. Susan, your remarks are profoundly important. And, and I'm going to say this, and, 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 and men don't get it twisted, right? There is a need for black men to approach and embrace feminism in the African tradition, in the radical African tradition. We are at the crossroads of the very survival of this planet. Not just our well-being dealing with these crazy crackers here in the United States, but of the very survival of the planet. And I will dare say, and I've said this publicly, and I ain't nobody's punk, right? That the feminine principle of our ancestors, the feminine principle of our indigenous ancestors, is the energy that is ultimately going to save the very earth we live on. And if we and, and in anything we formulate ideologically. Right, that should come down in the land of socialism, I dare say, right, has to be rooted on the spirituality of our ancestors and absolutely must include that, or we will never have the balance that we need to go forward further with this earth. Your remarks are profound, Susan. And and and, and Malcolm, Malcolm was on if he if, if he wasn't a doctrinaire fem with feminist, whatever that is, he definitely embodied how that can happen. Right. And, and and that's something to appreciate. He called hell in the nation of Islam because he stumbled on the irregularities of Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad was a man. And Elijah Muhammad, you know, contradicted the discipline that he he made famous with the nation of Islam. And that was one of the reasons why those internal contradictions blew up. Malcolm originally wanted to protect the man. But all that stuff, the jealousy and the envy that was being stoked by the by the informers and the provocateurs and by those jealous within the nation of Islam ultimately made him a target from within the organization that he built. He always stood up for black women and about his mother, right? At a critical point in his public life, when he was really becoming the Malcolm <laughs> of the world came to behold, his sister Yvonne said, you know, what are we going to do about mom? He went to Michigan and got his mother out yeah. of that institution. It wasn't publicized. Yeah. It wasn't on the front page yeah. of none of them papers. It wasn't in the black press. He said, little sister, you right. And he went and did it, right? So he had that in him. And ain't nothing punky about a black man standing up mm. for the black woman. Straight up. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, John Brinkley. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry I missed uh, some of the um, presentations, but um, follow up on uh, some of the things that Saeed said. Um, I was wondering, do you ever, and this is to the panel, do you ever, do you think that the nation of Islam has or will ever uh, reconcile itself with Malcolm? Has it or will it? Now, I don't want to talk too damn much, but I'm the only one with nation roots. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say two things. With the death of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the emergence of uh, Iman Wallace Muhammad, there was an effort to do that. One of the first things that uh, Imam Wallace did was make Moss number seven, he had it renamed after Malcolm as an act of restoration within the nation of Islam. In addition to that, he told, he told a story about all those problems that were going on within the nation that included, you know, his, his, his father's uh, indiscretions, right? There's a revisionism within the, the, the Farrakhan format of the nation of Islam that said, these are the wives of, of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Those women had to go to court for child support, right? And some of those women, had, did not get anything from the Elijah from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad until he died. Look at the the Ebony magazine when he, when when Elijah dies, the, uh, the 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 lawsuit against the estate of Elijah Muhammad. Right, Wallace was very honest about that, and he laid that stuff out. And it was that that made Talmadge Hare, the same Talmadge Hare who Brother Reuben popped and got caught on February twenty first come clean on the madness of his behavior in that. 
come clean and lay out a detailed confession that laid out how that went down, who was involved, and who did what to, 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 to come to terms with the mistake he know that he, he ultimately made and how wrong those brothers were, and that it was the only way that we were going to move forward is to be honest with that. And no investigative branch of no part of the United States government or the state of New York did anything with that. He made that confession in 1978. 1978. State of New York and the federal government kept that on a lock for years because they know their own complicity in the death of Malcolm X. So I don't, now, one last thing. One thing that Minister Farrakhan did that was important is that he did offer up that detente when uh, uh, Sister Kobila came under fire and almost got uh, locked up on conspiracy charges when that informant tried to plant some mess on her, right? They actually came together and made a peace. This is right before the Million Man March. That was important to do. Now, the nation is still doing with some, it's revisionist history and, and dealing with the, the divinity of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that, you know, the rest of the world doesn't agree with, right? And because they still deal with the divinity of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they're only going to go but so far. This, that's just how religion works. We need to be clear about that, right? But if they went further, it would be enormous. Farrakhan's ventures to Africa, to Gambia and Ghana, with Minister, uh, uh, well, we call him Brother Larry, right? With Minister Akbar, all of that. That's not that's not Elijah's line. That's Malcolm's influence on the nation of Islam, and the nation needs to be honest about that. So um, there's a ways to go, but some gestures were made. I, I'm Any, a little anyone less, else? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Doctor. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little less optimistic than, than Baba Zaid. <laughs> so you know, I'm gonna share. I didn't say I was optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I was in Chicago, I had a, a leadership program for high school students, and uh, many of my students were Muslim. They were in the nation. And one of the students' parents, well, I, which I found out, interestingly enough, one of their parents is the was one of the people who participated in the firebombing of Malcolm's home. Wow. And... He had he was held in high regard and respected in the nation. And I say that to say a lot of the people who went after Malcolm are loved and respected and revered in the nation to this day. So they don't rock with Malcolm. They don't rock with his memory. You know, they might do something publicly. They don't rock with him. So uh, and I don't know. I don't see it changing anytime soon. Yeah, there's another wrinkle to that, wait, right? Wait, let, 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 let me ask Dr. Sales if he right, wants right. to. Right, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> comments are right on, you know. Uh, they're right on target. All right. All right. I want to quickly say that uh, I remember reading about the final call some years ago about the Nation of Islam preserving their archives. And the article referred to Malcolm X because it talked about how they were preserving those archives too. And they referred to what happened um, between Malcolm and the nation, if I remember correctly, as a civil war. And so, you know, they're, they're clear and they've kept these records. And they're, as, as Dr. Harris is saying, as we even learned from the Netflix documentary, the people in the nation of Islam who are proud of the role they play to this day. They are proud of the role they play. You know, I, I was sitting in Maryland in graduate school and I couldn't believe that with all the, the violence that they happened to do it, that nobody felt like taking out William Bradley. I just couldn't believe it. Like, okay, how is this guy walking around? And I kept saying that. And how is this guy walking around doing it, right? But, I, but the Netflix documentary showed us that he was protected. He was clearly protected in the city of Newark by people who do not love Malcolm X. And, and that was disturbing to find out in the Netflix documentary. Wow. Let me tell you want to add, add yeah, to and that. And, that's, and that's, that's, you know, I actually was trying not to go there because this is sensitive, right? Uh, but, you know, I, you know I, I mentioned Khaled for a reason, right? Khaled had a, a parallel nation experience, not under Elijah, but under Louis Farrakhan, right? And, and in spite of that, Khalid Abdul Muhammad went to his death 
still defending and trying to honor Minister Louis Farrakhan, even though he survived an assassination attempt from someone in the nation of Islam. Okay. Uh, and, I, and the only reason I stayed in the New Black Panther Party as long as I did is because that's the bond that I made with that brother to do that for him. Right? Now, to that last point, I had to deal with, I, I had been confronted as, you remember, the New Black Panther Party was an armed organization that I was responsible for. Right? And as such, I was asked to give credence to orders, to an order from underground and from above ground, from several forces to have William Bradley taken out. And I did not do that. And I did that, do that, and I told those who asked me to give that order, I said, let me tell y'all something. That fool has got a foot in the grave and is almost 80 years old and didn't do a day for Malcolm's life or death. Do not think that what we're talking about is not known by those who should have put him in jail. I do not want y'all going to prison for something that they did not go to prison for. I would probably be locked up right now mm. if I gave that order. And I had the capacity to do that. That also should have been in that flick that they didn't put in there. Right? And I did that not just for our own protection, because in the end, Malcolm was trying to avoid that kind of war. Malcolm took the high ground, even though it cost him his life. He took the high ground on that. And sometimes you have to break those cycles of violence. I can't be out in the street telling fools, telling these young brothers to, to, to not kill each other, then turn around and give orders to do something like that. It contradicted everything that I had to do with the bloodletting that was already going on in the streets of Newark. You have to sometimes do things, even if you do not necessarily agree with them, to break cycles of violence because peace amongst African people means something too. Um, anybody else on the stack? Going once. Hold on, brother. Brother, uh, uh, <laughs> first of all, good evening and thank you so much. My name is Orion Johnson. You know, and I thank you so much for this wonderful presentation, uh, gentlemen. Uh, uh, my question is the following. Uh, uh, knowing the history, as you gentlemen, you know, do so well, and you've spoken eloquently about our history, how do we transpose that rich history that we have the benefit of enjoying and the great sacrifice that we enjoy? How do we take that information, that history, that sacrifice, you know, and and move into today with a viable solution as best you can. What does the modern uplift of our people look like standing on the shoulders of all those names you've mentioned? What does that look like? Let me, let me jump I, I in. Want, wait, wait, hold up, Todd. I want the panel to respond to that question, but also combine it with your closing remarks. That will be the last question for the night. So after you answer the question, if you have any closing remarks you'd might like to make, then go forward. Yes, Todd. Thank you, um, and, I, and I'll do that. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Brother Dean Chung. I um, think we should first put things like this on YouTube. I, I think we need to take that extra step, believe it or not, that extra step is not taken. The last two years, we've had all these conferences every night, right? Kwame Dre said we need to be organized, but we've had a black conference every night for two years, three years. Right, but why about again three years? Right, we're, we're keeping this on Facebook, but it needs to be on YouTube. YouTube is where people are, uh. YouTube is containing all of our stuff for the moment. That's an important thing to say first. Second, when things like this documentary out, I call it American Reckoning. Right, I don't know if you've seen the documentary that came out this week, American Reckoning, about the, the, the killing in Mississippi of the civil rights. Mm -hmm. leader. They show the footage of the defense. They show the footage of, of them on their knees holding the Bible, taking the oath of the deacons. And we need to show our people that to say, okay, look, we didn't just sit on a corner. We didn't just stand on a corner. All right. There were some people who said, no, we're not going to stand on the corner. We're going to protect ourselves. We're going to protect our leaders. And we need to, and I think this is very important. 
Because like I said, I, I deal with young people and I, I sting young people because they, they, they're not used to being stung. We need to show distinction. Barack Obama and Michelle Obama are what they are. They are not the manifestations of the Black Power Movement. We need to attack people like Peniel Joseph who say that bullshit. <laughs> All right? Um, we need to show distinctions. We need to show the difference between throwing the brick and not throwing the brick. And, and the, the, the differences are wide because, you know, for instance, I'm a biographer of Mumia Bujamal. I have my critiques of Mumia, which are going to come out, and, and everybody's not going to be pleased with me. But you know what I'm not critical about Mumia? Mumia saw his brother in jeopardy. He went into a glove compartment. He pulled out a gun, and he crossed the street. Now, what happened to him after that? Okay, the whole book's never been written about. We can argue about Mumia's behavior, and we can even argue about Mumia's choice to do that. But I think we all understand his choice of doing that. Because he was clear that he was not going to stand by, not stand in the corner, in his case, standing in a cab, and watch his brother be assaulted by a police officer. And we need to explain those distinctions so that everybody doesn't get a prize. Okay, I don't. I want to say this on record. I don't care about um, what's the sister in, in Atlanta who's going to be governor. What's Stacey Abrams? I don't care about the, the legacy of Stacey Abrams. I'm not interested in talking about Stacey Abrams. I'm not interested in coming to Stacey Abrams. You know what I care about? I care about the rule of Ben Wahad, who is not going to be here too much longer. I care about perspectives like that, of people who are not going to be, or now who are not here, like Maroon Schultz, who I had to go and type in a whole essay and have it ready three months in advance because I knew nobody was going to do anything. So when he died, I then took the essay and posted it on if it makes what I like. Because I knew nobody was going to do anything. <clears throat> That's tragic. All you black radicals, you sit there and you're not even prepared for that. And yeah, I'm talking about you about the dog again. Yep, I am. Because y'all, all y'all 80 years old, retired, you need to be doing things like this and not leaving it to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, whoever, whoever hears that, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. <laughs> All right? So, so I'm just saying that there are things we can do, but we're going to have to make the commitment to do them and the commitment to show our young people distinctions. Because, see, we have a whole generation of Black Power scholarships that's coming out with these Ivy League-educated scholars who don't even name our enemies. They write about the Black Power movement. Look, I'll name names. Ashley Farmer, Keisha Blaine, they write these books and they don't mark our enemies. So you're reading about Black Power like it's a sociology text. And I'm like, didn't these people have enemies? But what, what did they feel about their enemies? They never say. And then people like us, we're so cowardly, we don't review their books critically and say things like what they don't say because we're cowardly. And I mean all of us on this phone. So there are, there are things we can do, but they are basic, <laughs> but they're risky. And I think we have to go back. We're going back to Malcolm X. We have to go back to risk and to confrontation, another C, that we've lost the ability or lost the stomach to do. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Let's hear uh, the response to the question and closing remarks, uh, uh, Dr. Sales? Yeah, you know, I think that we have to give the current generation a standard of commitment, service, and integrity that comes out of the legacy of Malcolm X. In other words, they have to be very clear about what the times demand of them and how Malcolm can be very important in allowing them to understand how they can go forward in a totally unprecedented situation. And one of the important things that young people have to understand is that Malcolm teaches us that it is possible to change, you know, that you can improve yourself, 
and you can make that contribution that history demands. You know, Fanon said every generation rises from realms of obscurity and either fulfills its historic mission or betrays it. But we have to give our young people a sense of what the historic mission is and how the life of Malcolm mm. and his contribution sets some standards that if they can emulate will allow them to do what history, history demands. And, you know, Malcolm, he was honest to a fault. And what's so important about looking at his life is how he made monumental changes, not once, but repeatedly. You know, it was interesting. The young lady was talking about Malcolm's attitude toward women. I remember mm -hmm. I was interviewing uh, um, one of his associates. And the person told me that a whole lot of people, when Malcolm left the nation and when he formed Muslim mosque you know, or AU, that they found it very difficult to follow him on the question of women. Because he said at one point in wow. their development, he was teaching a very paternalistic view of women. Very stereotypical maternalistic view of women, right? His involvement in the movement here and in its African context caused a, a tectonic shift in Malcolm's, you know, whole perception of the role of women in revolutionary struggle, right? And so he, for a while, was way ahead of, of his constituency. Unfortunately, he didn't live long enough to bring them all, all with him. But we all have to have the honesty to change. You know, Todd was talking about courage, you know? And in these times, we need courage, and that courage oftentimes means to leave behind everything that you've committed to in the past and to step out into the unknown and to struggle for liberation because you know it's right, no matter what the consequences will be. You know, it's almost Shakespearean in a sense, to be or not to be, you know what I mean? <laughs> do, do you struggle and risk everything, right? Or do you do nothing, you know what I mean, to protect what, what, little, what little you have? Um, I don't know if there's going to be a generation after this one. That's how jacked up the world is today. That's how jacked up this country is today. You know what I mean? The very existence of the planet is, is, is on the agenda. And really, the historic mission of this generation is to save the planet. Right? That's a precondition of saving ourselves. Right? It's a monumental historic thing. Right? And if we betray that, there won't be a planet or another generation of us to worry about. It. Thank you, Dr. Sales. Zaid, do you want to respond to the question and yeah, give your um, closing did, did comment? Did Kelly want to say anything? No, you you go. We'll let Kelly go last. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I'm going to say this. I'm going I'm I'm to take a little issue with Todd because I believe in young folks, right? And that's why I did what I did for the years and, and took the risks that I took, right? And on the domestic terrorist list that I'm on, Right. Uh, I appreciate the summer of 2020 when I got off uh, the floor from COVID almost killing my ugly black ass. Right. To have to get right in the streets with our kids all up and down the damn country. Now, those are for the most part the limitations of spontaneous reactions to to our oppression. And we know from, from, from the limitations of some of those same spontaneous actors and the uprisings in the 1960s that they have limitations. But in the degree that those things took place and that there are some organizations that have come out of that, right? They may not organize the way we have organized in the past or the way we might organize now, but there are some serious organizing efforts that are taking place that do merit support. And when they surface, as they surfaced in that summer, they need our maximum support, right? Mm -hmm. I would say several things, right? We, we are not going to go anywhere. Like I mentioned, the whole question of the, the of embracing the feminine principle and our African spirituality at the core of what we do, I'll come back to that. But not only that, we absolutely need the discipline that Malcolm represented. We needed the organizations, the org and the, you know, the, the, the importance of organizing that he represented. And we need the question of study, right? Right? Uh, 
we belong to that, that we, we might be that last generation that read books from cover to cover in our in our study groups where we were yeah. not in class in college. Huh? In right. the name of building organization and honoring this black liberation movement. We have to encourage our kids to do the study that we used to do. And they'll find the answers. Our kids are not stupid. Right. And some of those kids who participated in burning some of them cities down, they're not afraid either. And they're also my comrade Akinelli uh, Omoja is uh, was in that documentary. I didn't get a chance to see it, but I wanted to see it, especially because I wanted to support him. There, there has quietly and very disciplined in a disciplinary way emerged some armed formations that protected some of our people in the streets. In 2020. Right. So I do. I don't tell kids in, uh, in my anti-violence work to sell their guns. I tell them to keep them. I tell them to develop the study, the discipline and the courage to become what the young lords became. They became revolutionaries. Right. What those lumping brothers who, you know, couldn't get down with the religion of, of, of the nation of Islam, but went in to the Black Panther Party. They became revolutionaries. Right. That that, you know, we can't put limits on people's development. If we're teachers, damn it, we got to teach. We got to teach struggle and let them babies know they're going to make mistakes like we made mistakes. But as long as they are courageous and sincere, that our ancestors got their back and we ought to have their back. Tell no lies, claim no easy fixes. Easy fixes. By way of, let me last with, end with this. February 21st is the anniversary of the assassination. Ilyasa Shabazz was hosting a, pro a program on uh, uh, at the Shabazz Center. Uh, I think it's going to feature uh, Cornell West. Um, I want folks to appreciate something that this young brother in New York is doing that I have to open up for on the 26th. One of the forgotten books about Malcolm is James Baldwin's One Day When I Was Lost, right? This book uh, was supposed to have been what later became the Spike Lee movie, but for whatever reason, uh, that didn't uh, happen. But it's a beautiful book, very lyrically and beautifully written the way James Baldwin writes. And James Baldwin was the voice that broke through for armed self-defense in the civil rights movement when they wouldn't let Malcolm come anywhere near them, right? And, and they tried to put muzzles on Baldwin, and he, would, he wouldn't take that, right? Uh, but and their relationship was special. There's a brother that's doing a stage reading of the play one day that I was lost at the Shabazz Center on the 26th of, uh, of February. And all those, you know, the libations that folks know me for, I wrote a poetic libation in response to, to Baldwin's one day and I was lost. And that was started me on this path of all these poetic libations. It's a, it's, a, it's a great book. It's a great story. And it's a forgotten contribution of Baldwin's legacy. Uh, to the, the, the to the black literary radical tradition, the black arts movement. Thank you, brother Zaid. And our last uh, remarked panelist, uh, Dr. Kelly Harris. Do you yeah. want to uh, respond yeah, I'll, to I'll the question I'll, and I'll make closing I'll, remarks? Yeah, yeah, I'll respond quickly and briefly. Um, one of the things I think we have to remember is that uh, <clears throat> the black struggle has always been uh, for a democracy that was broader than what this country ever intended. Um, so, you know, when we think about answers and solutions, we always have to look, go to our deep well of struggle uh, from di for different organizations and, and different personalities. Our answers are there. Um, with that being said, um, I think in, in keeping in line with uh, thinking about Brother Malcolm, um, we've mentioned Cointelpro a few times, but I think any struggle that we have, any solution that we have, we have to really begin to demand um, the un, uh, the releasing of all uh, files from uh, COINTELPRO, from the FBI to CIA. Um, we have to demand that those files be unredacted. Um, and, and this is the only way to me that we can really have any true form of reparations, any true form of moving forward, any true type of atonement. Um, that has to be a part of it. And of course, we have to struggle on multiple fronts. Um, so there's a variety uh, of things that we need to do, but I think that that's one thing that we need to do uh, moving forward. Thank you. 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 Th